Welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's show is brought to you by Herman Marshall Whiskey, Dallas County's first distillery of handcrafted award-winning small batch whiskey, patiently aged in new white oak barrels in the great state of Texas. Built from the grain up, just like good whiskey and better friends should be. They have a bourbon, a rye, and a blend, and they are also building a brand new facility that should be opening sometime this spring, so you guys get a chance to check it out. Please do so, because this is some good stuff, especially this time of year with the cold weather. Nothing better than a little bit of warm whiskey. Welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's guest is the pride of Duncanville High School. A former Aggie, if I'm correct, and yes, sir. A what else you did? And the son of an NFL was your? I think your dad was a what? Cornerback? Uh, he was a safety. safety. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes, so, my guest today, Mr. Johnny Chad Allen. Chad, how are you today, sir? I'm doing good, buddy. I'm doing really good, man. <laughs> uh, been a while. Good to see you, man. And uh, you know, looking forward to it. Yes, yes, sir. It has been a while. I mean, you've. Kind of lost track for a while after, you know, after playing, you got into, do you get into coaching? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, uh, it took me about two years, man. After I, after I retired, I, uh, the first thing my mom told me when I retired, she said, son, you got to go, you got to go graduate from college. So I, uh, it took me two years to go back and graduate from college. And then I was coaching here um, at a high school in Dallas called St. Mark's. And um, unbelievably enough, um, when I was coaching a game for St. Mark's, the uh, hitting coordinator for the Minnesota Twins, who was my hitting coach when I played, um, was saw me coaching. And he goes, hey, uh, would you like a job? And I'm like, what are you talking about? So he, uh, he wanted me to interview for uh, a job with the Twins. And I ended up doing it and um, coached with them for – for eight years and it was uh you know it was a great time man i love going back obviously to the organization that drafted me um but um got to see a lot of the old guys you know that i played with but um it was a it was an honor to kind of start my career where i you know, coaching where i started playing so with with a dad that played in the nfl you know most most people would think that that would be the the career that you would you would aim towards was that always a, was that ever a thought in your mind or were you, have you were you always a baseball guy yeah it was buddy um unbelievably enough man um so i was in the uh i was in the seventh grade and the very first tackle football game that i ever played in my entire life um you know my dad my brother played football all the way through high school i kind of came up um in oak cliff and actually uh, we would play backyard football with kids that went to Dallas Carter. So I'm talking about the guys who played against Odessa Permian in Friday Night Lights. And that's who we played, you know, kind of, you know, backyard football with when I was growing up. They were five years older than me, but, you know, that's who we played with. Um, so my first football game that I ever played in, um, I played quarterback and uh, a guy hit me uh, straight up. And his face mask uh, broke my face mask and went into my mouth and completely tore off my top lip. So that was my first experience of tackle football. Um, I got about 100 stitches in my mouth. That's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, that was my first experience with football. But unbelievably enough, I probably got, I don't know, probably 50, 60, 70 stitches in my mouth to put, you know, to put a new mouth on. Um, but about six weeks later, man, I got right back out there and I, I, I went right back to playing again. And then I went to Duncanville uh, and played uh, quarterback at Duncanville and probably was sacked about, I think I was sacked probably on average about 10 to 12 times a game because my offensive line wasn't too good. So I told my dad, my, my actually my dad told me my sophomore year, he goes, son, you need to make a decision about what you want to do. And um, at the time, Duncanville wasn't really a powerhouse in football, but we were really good in baseball. Um, so I just decided to go the baseball route. <laughs> do you remember who hit you? Did that, did that guy ever end up going and playing at the next level? <laughs> or was it just... <laughs> 
I know that's no, one of those things where you definitely no, I, somebody I hit you. Who, I don't remember who hit me because I was knocked out like a light. Um, unbelievably enough, probably about uh, I think it was probably about four months later. Um, I was playing, obviously, you know, my the Christian school that I went to in, uh, you know, when I was in middle school, we ended up playing about four months later, we ended up playing the same team in a basketball game. And that kid who hit me uh, was playing basketball against me. So I saw him again, probably four months later. And uh, yeah, he's got something to put up on his wall, I guess you could say, uh, by knocking a kid, pretty much knocking a kid's head off in the seventh grade, I guess you could say. <laughs> just happened to be mine <laughs> <laughs> and that's usually what it takes it's one shot and then it's kind of yeah this is not for me i'm gonna have to make a decision yeah uh, I'm, yeah yeah uh, oh my gosh i mean it's that's another stuff you don't you don't ever hear about and seeing that stuff and being hit in the face or anything else but yeah. even play what about just playing on the other side of ball of being the one giving the hits as opposed to well, was that he, even a thought too? I, I ended up I, I played defensive back of course that's what you know my dad my dad always you know would take me and my brother in the backyard run routes you know teach us how to you know defend teach us how to run routes um i played defensive back uh you know for duncanville but because i could throw the ball they didn't want me to play defense and quarterback at the same time because they didn't want me to get hurt um, because I was the only guy that could throw the ball over, you know, 30 yards. Um, but um, would I have loved to probably have played, you know, defensive back? Yeah, I love throwing the ball. Um, you know, that was my thing. I had some wide receivers that could catch it. But unfortunately for me, you know, I just didn't have an offensive line that could protect me. And so I kind of gave it up. Uh, but, you know, I think I made a, a, a pretty good decision on that. But um, it was a lot of fun. But, yeah, to have the injury I have in the very first game I ever played in my life, that was that was pretty uh, – that was a good, uh, you know, opening to my football career. So, wait, so you, you quit playing football what? When your sophomore year, junior year? Yes, what? sir. Your yes, sophomore sir. year? Yes, sir. Yep. So, so that's when it was. So it was you always played baseball, though, too. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yep. Yep. But you're, yeah. but you're, so, I mean, what was your, you know, everybody has a passion, right? That's what, it, you know, it's, you know, I was a hockey and baseball guy. I wanted to, you know, one, like you said, you wanted to do both. And then I wasn't fortunate enough to be hit in the mouth to the point where I <laughs> had to make a decision <laughs> where your parents said, well, you can do that. Yeah, sure. It was just more of, you know, well, what do you want to do? So I think, you know, well, you know, do baseball. So, you know, you go, so you're continuing to play baseball and then what you end up, did you ever get drafted out of high school or you just go, you end up going to A&M? Unbelievably enough, buddy, I was drafted out of high school um, in the tenth round by the Houston Astros as a pitcher. Um, and in high school, I played, uh, you know, I played center field, but I also pitched. And I ended up being an All American uh, pitcher before I was even, uh, you know, an All American hitter. Um, so I wasn't a pitcher; I just threw. Uh, you know, I had a decent arm, um, but. You know, the, the kind of recognition that my high school had when I played, we were, I guess, two of the three years I was in high school, we were the number one team in the country. And so we kind of got a lot of a lot of press, whatever it may be. But, you know, I was the guy who could throw decently hard and, you know, we had a good record and guys would come see us play and and they they ended up drafting me as a pitcher obviously i turned it down and went to a&m but i didn't want to pitch i had you know i i closed at a&m for two years um but just because i wanted to compete it had nothing to do with you know that i was a good pitcher it's just i wanted to compete and i wanted to be on the mound when the game mattered um just because i had that confidence in myself but um you know i had no passion at all to want to pitch uh in the pros um, I wanted to hit because that was kind of, you know, my passion to be able to hit with, you know, our hitting coach Rudy at 16. That's, uh, you know, that's that was special for me. And that's kind of what got my fire honestly going that I might have a chance to play baseball at the next level was being able to hit with such a great hitting coach with Rudy. Yeah, you see, I mean, you see now a lot of guys are basically pigeonholed into being either a pitcher or a position player, right? They're, they're not doing both like you were talking about wanting to do. And I think it, it yeah. starts at a younger age too now, right? You know, you, you know, oh, you buddy. played and understand of how you, you want guys to be able to play multiple positions because of, right? If somebody asks coach, hey, who can do this? Yep, sure. Who can I? Most of them don't, right? And that's where, yeah. and now where the game's going, there's no pitchers aren't hitting anymore. So that's just going to yeah. become obsolete. So, yeah. uh, so you know, with, with the team you played with, um, how many of those guys that actually went on to play at the professional level other than you 
from uh, from Duncanville that year, from when you were there? Uh, that year we had, uh, let me see, we had one, two, three, four, five. We had six guys go play in the minor leagues. Nobody play, Nobody else played in the big leagues but you? No, sir. No, sir. Okay, so you guys had a pretty good team then. And then when you're yeah. at A&M, how many of those guys? Because I played with some guys from A&M. You know, yeah. uh, I think, didn't Tyner go there? JT went there. Yes, Jay he did. Tyner. Didn't yes, Joe, he did. I think Joe Dillon as well, right? Uh, no, Joe, Joe Dillon went to Tech. Oh, he went to Tech. Okay. It, yes, sir, to Texas Maybe Texas. it was Fossum. Um, it Maybe was, it was Casey Fossum that went to A&M. Casey Fossum was, That's what yeah, I'm... he was filthy, buddy. But we had a pitcher uh, who was actually my roommate who pitched for Tampa uh, named Ryan Roop. And actually, unbelievably enough, man, I'll never forget, we were – when me and you were teammates, we went to Tampa and we played Tampa and we faced him. And, you know, the, the guys were asking me, you know, what's this guy? And I said, man, he's 92 to 96. And you're like, you're full of crap. And he ended up being 92 to 96. But he had uh, thoracic outlet syndrome uh, surgery twice. Um, so it kind of ruined his career. But he was a damn good pitcher. Really good. Yeah. That's when the p- people are listening. That's when they take that rib out through the collarbone, right? Kenny Rogers had that. Yep. Had that. Yep. Had to have it twice. He had to have it twice, buddy. Yeah, he had. To, he got it. I guess, man, he got it his junior, his junior year in college. He got it. Um, had surgery. Sat out the whole year. Came back his senior year and just pitched lights out. Got drafted. Pitched for Tampa. Uh, in the big leagues, I'm gonna guess probably about a year and a half, maybe, and then dude, it it it, it for some reason, God bless him, it came back and um, he had he just shut it down. It so, was unfortunate. Oh gosh, you hear? I mean, you don't see that usually if they do it the first time. It's 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 out of there. So uh, yes, sir. So that yep. so you're dra- you got drafted in what year? I got drafted in '96. Out uh, of, uh, my junior year at a Okay, so that so then with it was it the Twins, correct? Yes, sir. So yep. you so you came so we've had one of your teammates on here before, but that that group that yep. came through there, what the Jock Jones, Tory Hunters, yep. Yep. Doug McCavich, yep. uh, who else was Ortiz in there a- too? AJ Przinsky. AJ was in that group too, right? I yeah. forgot about that. Yeah, I mean we pro- the, the the unbelievable thing about that year with the Twins, man, is I think if I'm not mistaken, the top uh, if I'm not mistaken the top seven picks that year in '96 six of the seven made it to the big leagues that's pretty good so and that's that what I'm, pre- and you guys came through together correct most of you came all through all of us all of us came together every single one of us came together man it was uh you know that's the one thing obviously we don't see anymore uh it, it, you know in the minor leagues coming up and i think that's something minnesota did extremely well of um they kept us together and they made us a family um, in the minor leagues. So when we got to the big leagues, our family was already set. We knew each other. We knew our ins and outs. We knew, you know, what made each other go. Um, you know, we knew, uh, you know, the little tweaks that we had made hitting wise because we had hit together so much. We knew each other's families. Um, so to me, that is, that's something that if you look at that team, unfortunately for me, I left after, you know, three three years in the big leagues, I left, and then they went to the playoffs for, I think, I don't know, the next three years, maybe in a row, four years in a row. Um, but that team, that family that they, you know, that they created back in 97, um, you just don't see that anymore. But I think they did it right by keeping all of us together and building that camaraderie. Um, and it was it – was, those guys are obviously great players. Love playing with them, but that's one thing I wish the, that you know teams would do more of now is like keep kids together, keep the camaraderie together, and um, you know that way when everybody gets to the big leagues, they have that camaraderie, they have that knowledge of each other, and then they go. But that's obviously hard to do. That doesn't happen anymore. Who was managing? Was it was it Guardy or was it was Tom Kelly? Uh, uh, our first three years was Tom Kelly. And then uh, Gardy came in after that. Was Gardy in the organization before he got bef- before he got that managerial job, or was it just? Yes, sir. He was our third base coach. Yep. Okay, so you yep. guys had been around him too, right? And oh then, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, Gardy, Gardy was he was one of the best players managers you will ever play for. He is a great man. Yeah, and then uh, I'm trying to think of your coaching staff. Who was at third base and at first base? I can't. I cannot remember. Uh, Reggie Reggie White was at first. 
uh scotty olger was our hitting coach that's right um let's see it was uh rick anderson what pitching coach um Rick Stelmazic was our bench bench coach, so it was it was pretty good, man. We yeah, so you've been around teams. that, and that's what you don't see anymore. And is that so? Our, you know, our draft year of of, of ninety nine was the, that made it that year was Colby Lewis, Hank Blaylock, myself, Aaron Harang. I think that was five of our first seven picks. No, Nick Regilio as well. That, Nick that Regilio, made, yeah. Yep, that had made it through. You know, you're right. You don't see that anymore. You yep. don't see, and we basically came through to you know every year we were playing together. Mm -hmm. All and you're right. You, that camaraderie you build and understanding doing it together. Now it just seems as if these guys are on their own program where they don't kind of. So so you know so getting through to that you know playing you know you got you blew out your ACL. What year was that? I blew up my ACL in 2001. 2001. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. played a few more years and then got out. What was your last year? 07, 06, 07? 07. Yes, sir. My last year was 07 in Japan. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you were over there. You went over there and played and then just took a took a step back for a little bit and then then got into coaching and stuff. But you know, we we talk about the coaching nowadays of you know, you talk about Rudy being your hitting guy as even when you're sixteen. You know, right now you see yeah. guys that are they jump from one to the other because of what they see on TV. So what did you, as a coach, you were a hitting coach. Where'd you start? Did you start how low and down in, in minor league baseball? Where you, did you start? Did you start a rookie bar or did you just jump right into double a or I jumped right. Yeah. I jumped right into, I was blessed enough, man, to, to go into, to uh, straight into double a. Um, and the, the, you want to talk about again, a great start to your career, man. Um, so we we start out the year in Richmond, Virginia. My first first game I ever coached in the minor leagues, and we're playing a doubleheader because we got snowed out the first day. So the first game of a doubleheader, we play seven innings, and we get no hit. And I'm going, Lord, uh, is this the right thing that I need to be doing right now to start off with a no hitter? Uh, but yeah, that's that's another one, uh, another introductory to minor league baseball as a coach where you start off your first day is getting uh, no hit <laughs> who was your manager at the point at that time uh jeff smith i don't know if you remember schmitty he that was name uh, sounds familiar was he a was he a pitcher he was a catcher Ca okay a catcher. yes sir that makes, yeah <laughs> as a manager i mean is <laughs> <laughs> yeah what did he say something to you or did you have to say something to him i mean no, it's one it, of those it, things it, where you're just unbelievably enough unbelievably enough you know i go in i go into the you know obviously we go in we get about a 45 minute break after the game and and my pitching coach i don't know if you know if you know the name Stu clyburn yeah um, but he is Stu is a peach i mean he is just a just a laid back good man that you know he just a, he's just one of the best so anyway uh, Stu actually coached me when i played and so he he knew me, and he actually coached Schmitty too. So he had been there a long time, and he said, "Chad, you know, here's the really good thing that you can look forward to after you just got no hit." He goes, "You've only got one way to go, buddy. So you can only go up from here. So take that as a positive that every single hit you get from here on out is just going to make you go up." <laughs> I'm like, "Stu, thank you for that, but damn, that ain't a good way to start." Did you have any of the guys on that team play in the big leagues? That you oh have. man, let's see. Uh, Jorge Polanco, obviously, is a he's a pretty damn good player right now. Uh, in the you know for the Twins, he's still there. I had Jorge Polanco that year, and I had um, Miguel Sano that year, um, but uh, that was probably the only two. Uh, you know, after that is when the Buxtons, the Keplers, uh, you know the kind of the horses that they had for about five years came in but those first couple of years with the twins our minor league system was absolutely loaded was Sano built like he is now when you were with him? uh no buddy his his first year in the minor leagues I think he was six five two thirty and uh you know the last year I was with the twins in 18 he was six five about uh 295 300 goodness gracious yeah he was a bull he's a bull and he yeah. could hit though right he could hit hit it a mile couldn't he he's probably one of the strongest kids i've ever seen uh as far as hitting a ball uh 
you know, obviously, uh, I, I think him and a guy named, I don't know if you remember the name, there was a guy named Kenny Vargas who was about 6'6", six, six, probably weighed 3'10", switch hitter that, that, that uh, you know, played first for the Twins. I think he still might have the highest exit velocity ever in baseball. Uh, I'm not, I mean, don't quote me on that, but I do remember he hit at 119, uh, about five, I think it was about five ten to left center. I mean, you just, he, both of those guys could hit at 470, 480 at will. I mean, they, they were just men. And that's something you can't teach. You definitely can't teach the, the, no. the strength and everything else. So, no. you know, so, so it's, you know, so going through the, the philosophy that you were taught to hit, right, with, with Rudy. Um, yeah. We always, you know, we've talked about this before on the show with Rudy, probably the best hitting hitting coach in all of baseball, you know, with never played a lick, you know, other than, you know, through in high school stuff, but studying the game and understanding the game and, and the process that he taught and to see that and to get into professional baseball and you're coaching now and seeing this, when did you start to see these swings change as opposed to how we were taught to yes, sir. now? Okay, so, but uh, my, f in 2012 to 2000, I'm going to guess six, 15 or 16, I'm not exactly sure of the exact time, um, but I think it was about 2016. Um, so a gentleman named Terry Ryan was the uh, GM of the Minnesota Twins. And Terry Ryan was a very, I don't like to say the word old school because baseball is baseball. There's no such thing as old school baseball, new school. It's just baseball. And Terry Ryan believed in playing the game the right way and teaching the game the right way. And so we taught guys to situational hit. We taught guys how to, you know, you get a guy on third base, nobody out. You're, you, you will get him in somehow. Okay. And we do not strike out. Um, you know, we're not trying to hit home runs. Um, we're trying to play the game the right way. There are a few guys like David Ortiz who could obviously hit homers, but David wasn't going up there trying to hit a homer. He was just blessed enough to have man strength and, you know, hit homers. Um, but so Terry Ryan left the Minnesota Twins, and I, I'm going to guess 15. I'm not exactly sure. But in 2016, we had new guys come in to the, to, uh, the organization, a GM, um, and the analytical side of baseball was introduced to me in 2016. Um, it was, uh, I guess, a tough pill to swallow, to be honest with you. I'm not saying there's, there is a definite place in baseball for numbers. 100% um, there is. It, it can, the video, the numbers, they can teach you a lot. But as far as teaching the mechanics of the swing, numbers can't tell you that and so the numbers what they go by is obviously exit velocity launch angle attack angle um you know different terms that they that that the analytical side uses and so that became very prominent in about 2016 i would guess and so you know that aspect of kind of turning behind the ball getting a little bit of a you know more elevation was being taught and there are certain kids in the game 100 percent that can swing and be able to hit in my opinion with de decent average but also hit for power but then in my opinion there were guys like me who weren't necessarily i would say power hitters but we could hit a little bit for average um, and and do the small things correct. And that phase of the game, in my opinion, has con has completely gone out of the game. About 90% of it has gone out of the game. You know, the back when we played, there was no such thing as a shift because guys knew how to beat the shift. And beating the shift is not being taught anymore. And it's just hit the ball, hit it as hard as you can, and try to hit it out of the park. If you strike out, no big deal. And that drove me absolutely insane. Um, and so, you know, I looked at this the other day. Um, in 2015, 33 guys in the big leagues hit 300. In 2022, 11 guys hit 300. That's pretty bad.
Yeah, yeah, it is. And you, and you talk about it. So when the, when that new regime came in, I know Guardy had left. Didn't Guardy leave for a little bit and then come back to the Twins? Yeah. Was, yep. was he yep. was he back at that point or was he gone? Um, Guardy Guardy had left. He had gone to Detroit, um, and so. Um, it, it was hard for the hitting department because a lot of the hitting department was still from the Terry Ryan regime. So we really, really, really struggled with it. And so by the end of 2000, in, in a two year span between 2016 and 2018, every single person in the hitting department of the Minnesota Twins was fired because it was not the new regimes hitting guys so they brought in all new hitting guys and uh you know pretty much fired every single hitting coach and actually majority of the coaches who were there in the minor leagues they also fired um so they just brought in all you know pretty much just brought in new people for the whole entire organization um so that was kind of a tough pill to swallow for all of us is to you know not be able to teach, uh, get a guy over, get a guy in, um, you know, with two strikes, bear down, you know, make contact, put the ball in play. Um, and they would flat out tell us, you know, a, a, a single does us no good. And I'm like, well, it gets the pitch count up. It gets a guy on first base. It gets a guy in the stretch. More things can happen. And they're like, no, we want doubles and homers only. If you strike out, it's okay. It's okay. And we're like, golly, man, this is just—it's it's just not the way the game's supposed to be played. Um, but you know, I'm—I'm I'm not saying that 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 there are guys out there that can hit and think elevate the baseball. That's okay. Not everybody hits the same. Not everybody, you know, uh, has the same mechanics or swings the same. But there are a few guys out there that you know, that I was working with that they could not do that. And it, it, it took them from 280, 290 hitters to 230, 240 hitters. And their home runs only went up about five or six. And to me, it took away a lot of guys potential to maybe possibly make it to the big leagues. But when you're talking about hitting homers and doubles, to me, the, you know, the David Eckstein's, um, you know, like a, a guy back in the day, the Brett Butler's, those guys, I'm not sure they play. I'm not sure they play in the big leagues these days. Yeah, the, I, I just don't see it. The um, table what's, setters. What's that? The table setters. The guys that you go out and they put together 10, 12 pitch at bats to get the yeah. next guy up. Yeah. And, and we all, we, we've, we've tried to figure this out. What happened? Who, what, I mean, I know money ball has become you know, early 2000s, but did the money ball create this analytical side of it or was it, uh, what, I mean, what have you heard? I mean, I know you've, you know, well, you've talked to guys throughout. Well, what have you it, heard? It, yeah. The, 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 the unfortunate thing, man, is, is, you know, I, I tell people this all the time, me and you, me and you obviously played against the teams that were in that money ball arena. And how many times during that money ball arena, did they say anything about the, the four starting pitchers that the Oakland Hayes had during that year. And, you know, those guys were extremely good, which made them obviously pretty damn strong. But after they kind of created that, you know, whatever you want to call it plan of, okay, we can do this without spending money. Tampa took a hold of that and Tampa kind of <clears throat> ran with the fact of we can do the, this, this, money ball thing we can do this numbers thing and so when they started making the playoffs everybody's like well what is tampa doing well tampa was a, the, probably one of the first big time uh you know analytical people and then you know the dodgers got into it and that the big teams got into it so now everybody gets into it um and it, it just became kind of a pandemic of the whole entire of all of baseball becoming analytical driven and you look at uh you know coaches now getting hired in the big leagues who are strictly analytical guys and i have no problem with that that's that's their choice god bless them good for them but at the same time you have to have baseball people who have played the game to be able to teach 
the mechanics because analytical people cannot teach mechanics. All they can do is read numbers, and that is a good thing. I mean, we need that. But at the same time, you have to have the guys who can actually take those numbers and tell the kids, okay, this is what they see. How can we tweak what you feel and what you're doing to make it maybe make it a little bit better? They don't know how to do that. We, you know, the, the, the guys who played the game, they understand it. They've been in the box. They know how it feels and they can hopefully help that kid get better. But that's the one thing that's a little bit frustrating to me with why I left the Cubs was the fact that the analytical part that would come to us, they would give us, you know, all these presentations of, of stuff on analytics of what is the proper launch angle for a ball that's middle away? What, what is the proper, proper attack angle for a ball that's middle away? Well, not you, you can't cookie cut a ball or, or a swing of every single player middle away. I may go to it differently than you. You know, the next person may go it differently for me, but you maybe get three different results, but they're all decent results. So I think the one thing that, that really, really frustrated the hitting department when I was with the Cubs was is they would bring all these presentations to us, but they never ask us our, to give a presentation or for us to give our side of the story or for us to go, hey, when you're in the cage and you talk to players, what do the players say about analytics? Because they don't want to hear it. They know what the players say about analytics. Now, again, not all analytics is bad. It is really good for the game. But there are certain aspects of it. When you get into the cage, if I'm in the cage and a guy's yelling out a number to me or he's saying I'm two degrees below, you know, two degrees negative, I'm like, bro, I'm trying to feel something. Can you just please calm down and let me feel what I need to feel to get it right? And they don't they don't understand that. And there's and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think the communication between the analytical department and the hitting department, because you have two different hypothetical uh, ideas, there's no family, man. And, and that's the one thing I loved about the twins. We were all family. And now majority of organizations are not families. You know, you, you don't have people going for a common goal. You have too many egos in a basket and they only want their ideas to work. Well, a family doesn't do that. And that's one thing I wish the game would get back to is the understanding of, do we need analytics? 100%. Do we need guys who know how to coach the game? 100%. But put that in a basket and make it a family. You don't see that. That, or of course, I never did there's for the no, last five there's no, for the last five years that I coached. There's no agreeing to disagree. It's either it's either my way or the highway. I remember that's it. Uh, that's it. Guardy was here uh, at the old ballpark. We we sat in there and talked for a little bit, and he goes, "Manchi, he goes, I got guys in the big league that shouldn't be above a ball, but oh, yeah. my hands are tied. You know, they're just running because of, and, and that's the problem. You know, we we've throughout this 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 show that I've had guys on, they talk about." information like you said i'm in the box i'm not thinking about all right the 33 degree angle and a ball away right mm -hmm. you already have enough to think about how hard somebody's throwing and then these guys this process of what they're doing right and then they're swinging it well that angle wasn't this that's what i mean these it's analytics to me i i you yeah. know there's no i don't see you know you talk about you see that there is a place for it but I think the only way to get a balance of, of that is to, it seems like we went from one extreme to the other. Yeah, it's there, like there was got, no middle ground. No. There was, uh -uh. Just, there was and, and so, it, and, and I think that's the tough thing, man, is, is like, you know, when, when a person comes into a presentation into a new organization or into a new company, I think the, the, the biggest thing when me and you hit with Rudy, what did Rudy always say? What do you feel? Right. What do you feel? What do you what do you see? But I think the analytical department comes in when they give a presentation. Did they ask the coaches, what do you feel or what do you see? No, no. All they did was they gave their presentation. They didn't let us speak on our side. And I think that's the thing that's tough for them is 
I had to learn that language. I had to learn the numbers. I had to learn how to use a computer and how to present that to my hitters. But did they ever go in a room and take six guys like Ryan Sandberg, Andre Dawson, all these great, phenomenal ex-Cubs and go, let's talk about hitting. They never did it. Never. And I'm like, why would y'all not want to listen to Ryan Sandberg and Andre Dawson? Like, wh what? Like, what are we doing? And, but it was all about their numbers. Well, if I'm a hitter, I want to hear what Ryan Sandberg and Andre Dawson did because they're, they're Hall of Famers and they're really, really good. We never did. That. Never. Not one time. No, when it comes to the guys that, that you're around, you see, that's, you know, nowadays, Guys are throwing harder, but they're teaching yeah. longer swings, right? They're yeah. teaching these barreled yeah. up longer swings. You know, you, you like your swing, you, you, by the way, guys, Chad can hit a three wood better than anybody can hit any club. And it's a low <laughs> burner, right? It's that down backspin ball. But that's, that's kind of like some of the balls that we would hit, right? My yeah. launch angle wasn't 33 degrees. Mine yeah. was like 12 degrees, but it had backspin. So it started at 12 degrees and ended up at 30 because of, you know, like the ballpark here, ball out to right center, you hit yeah. something down and it just looks like it's a line drive to center and all of a sudden it goes out of the ballpark because it, yeah. it but the numbers say, well, that doesn't work. Well, yeah, yeah, it, it does work. And that's the thing it's, and they, and you, they want to teach, you know, a guy to hit like Aaron judge, that's Jose Altuve size, right? You, they're trying to teach yeah. each, each batter. It's an individualized drill for people. And they want to show, well, this is the feel of how this is. First of all, Unless you played at the at the level we have, you, you don't know what it's like to deal with one sixty thousand people around you, that yep. amount of pressure, talking, running, you know, and everything else. And now on top of it, having to figure out what guys are throwing because at that level, balls move all over the place. Yep. And I think that's the problem. The, the, I mean, like you talk about, team averages are in the what the two twenties because yeah. it's just because it's it's this thought process of oh my gosh, just stop. Maybe they all need to play hungover. Oh. Right, because it yeah. seems like that way they wouldn't be thinking about anything but throwing up, and then maybe they would just go out and just let their – they're not allowed to let their ability, their natural abilities take over. No, no. Right? No. Guys don't no. – like you talked about in the beginning of – guys don't – they don't hit anymore. They just swing the bat, right? They're not taught to to do that. It's like guys no. pitching. They don't pitch anymore. They just throw. Grant, there are some. And when you talking about – you know, baseball now, the, the only way that I think this kind of levels it out are these old school managers and coaching staffs. You know, they brought Bochi in here. Old school guy, Mike Maddox, old school pitching coach, guys that are going to say, you know what, you can take those numbers and basically shove them back up your backside because that's not me. And if you want me to manage, I want to manage how I want to manage. I'm not going to be a puppet. But it seems like what you're saying is the coaches – and that it starts at the top that you're a puppet and you're told what to do and not question it. Well, then what's the point? It's like you're all paddling in different directions, going in a circle. And like you yeah. said, you don't have a voice to say anything. Yeah. It, you know, but my thing would be is, man, is, you know, it, it's never going to happen in the history of baseball. I, I, I get it. But, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough to, to get to see Michael Young uh, every once in a while. And I say this to a lot of people. Okay. Mike, I, I don't know exactly what Mike's best years were. Mike hit 300 a, a lot in his career. I know he did. But I would like to see a team that had nine players on it that hit 290, and they hit between 10 and 18 home runs, every single one of them. I'd be willing to bet that team has a strong chance of going to the World Series. But you've got majority of teams now you look at, there is maybe one guy that hits 300 and the rest of them are hitting 220 to 240 with 20 to 30 home runs. But when the playoffs come, what do they do? You know, the, the, it's just, you know, the Phillies hit five home runs in the World Series in one game and they won five to nothing. The very next game, they get no hit. Now, am I saying that that can't happen? Sure. God bless us. It can happen. I mean, it's good. The guy had a great day on the mound. Tip your hat, you win. But I'm saying if you had 10 guys or nine guys that went up there that were scrappers and that didn't want to strike out and that wanted to put the ball in play, maybe things are different. I don't know. You're but I I'll tell you a funny story, buddy. One of the last few days that I was in spring training in 2000, 
I guess it was, gosh, 2020, had a guy come in and he presented this, he presented this to the minor leagues and the big leagues, bud. And, and, and God bless us. It is what it is. But he said three, two count bases loaded. Okay. Three, two count bases loaded. And the ball is an inch to two inches off the plate. We want you to take it because we the 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 numbers say that uh 50% of the time it's going to be a ball and 50% of the time it's going to be a strike and i'm like dude do you understand like you're telling a kid that is going up there facing 98 to 100 with an 88 mile an hour slider that he can he's going to know 100% that that ball's an inch or two off the plate like literally that is just like you've never been in the box. You don't want to know what it's like. You don't know what movement is. It's extremely hard to do. And you've got about 0.1 seconds to make that decision. And then you're going to go, oh, no, that's an inch off the plate. I'm not going to swing at it because I've got a 50% chance of getting on base. I'm like, bro, you can't present that to people. You can't. But that's the kind of stuff that they're bringing to these kids, man, going like, have you been in the box and faced someone? Because, it, dude, when you're in a situation base is loaded, obviously we're going to be a little tense. We got 60,000 people around us. But I know one thing, if the ball's around the plate and I've got bases loaded and nobody out or one out, I'm going to try to put the damn ball in place so I can get an RBI. Instead of going, I think it's two inches off the plate, I'm going to take it, and then I'm going to get rung up. When I go back to the plate, the guy's going to go, oh, well, the number said it was a ball, but the umpire called it a strike. Well, guess what? I'm 0 for 1. Instead of being 0 for 1 with an RBI or 0 for 0 with an RBI, they would prefer us to take it and either strike out or walk. I'm like, dude, you guys are just, it, it's nuts. It's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life. And that's what, and, and I know now, I mean, you've, the, you know, the way the strike zones are set up where every, there's camera angles and everything. They have, you know, robot, robots doing the umpiring. I saw, I've seen in the fall league, I think they're challenging balls and strike calls. I mean, yeah. and I th that's what I mean. What, what does this come to of where, oh, I didn't like that. I'm going to challenge it. I mean, this, this generation of, oh. it's almost as if that I can't win. I don't want to play. I want to, I need to complain and do this and do that. And, you know, we're going to make mistakes, right? As, as humans, even as batters, as pitchers, right? It's, but, you know, you go up there and, you, like you said, you take a 3-2 fastball that's borderline that, you you know, that's going to be on the black. You're not taking it. You're going to try and put no. it in play. No. Because no. if you do, the guys that are on first, second, and third are going to go, what the hell are you doing? What, exactly. what's, what is going on here? I, yeah. You know, as much as they want to say, well, the numbers say this, you're going, no, because as hitters, what's our job? It, it's yeah. to put the ball in play to, to – that's like you talk about. That's money in the bank, putting especially guys on base of knowing yeah. what yeah. you can do, right? And yeah. you know, and I taught that to my kids was as as a coach was, well, why do we take until you know until we get a strike? Because one, you're, you you want to get pitch counts up, you want to wear these guys out. But, but now they're we're we're working to we're gonna have seven man rotations. Guys are gonna throw matter. three, yeah, yeah. Three, three innings. Yeah. But but yeah. the more you see guys and do stuff, the more opportunity you're giving the guys behind you to do yeah. it. Yep. But no, yep. don't do that. The numbers don't, and that's what, yep. and that's what I mean. It's guys that have never played beyond little league think yep. that I went to, you know, I, I went to, I have a degree in biomechanics. I know how the swing works and this and that. Okay. Well then tell me what it's like to stand in the box to see exactly. what, you know, a guy when Tim Hudson's in Oakland, it throws 94 to a hundred and the ball moves three feet. You know what it's <laughs> like to sit there and see what, what you can do. Tell me, yeah. tell me what the numbers say. Yeah. Right. Well, don't swing at that ball that starts in, in that upper third quadrant because it's going to be a ball. No, that ball will move about three feet to the out, other half, the outer outside of the box, and it's a strike. But you said don't because the, the numbers say thirty eight yeah. percent of the time it's a ball. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I mean. So you, you've seen these kids as robots, right? It's, they just oh, yeah. seem to be want more information. What, what else can I need to do as opposed to just just go out and hit the damn ball, right? Where you were well, taught to hit it hard, hit it at somebody, stay through the middle of the field. Yep. Not much up, you know, you know, yep. barrel dump. And you talk about with Rudy, Rudy didn't change much, right? He talked nope. about, he talked about the nope. feel. What are you feeling? Yep. If it didn't work, it wasn't work. Hey, what are you feeling? And I yep. think that's taken away from hitters and pitchers. It is. As, it is. Of Completely. their philosophy of being able to, right? They want to be told what they're doing wrong. Well, what are you doing? As opposed to asking them the question. And they look at you like, you know, you talk to your dog. Well, yeah. 
I don't know. Nobody's ever asked me. And that's well, what's getting away from it, right? Yeah. The, 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 the biggest, the biggest, in my opinion, the biggest thing that is taken away from the game, especially in the hitting department, is feel. And um, for kids to understand feel, because, you know, back when me and you played, we had a little bit of, you know, video of technology but we didn't have it like we have it today that can break it down inch by inch or whatever you know number by number um but i think the biggest thing is is like teaching a kid feel and to understand to be able to make an adjustment pitch by pitch and i think that's the biggest thing i learned playing with the twins was okay how can I make an adjustment off one swing that I just missed a fastball or a slider? I may have been a little under, I may have been a little late, whatever it may be. How can, now I'm going to make an adjustment right here and that's not going to happen again. And that's the one thing that is gone from the game is instead of teaching feel, we teach numbers or we go to the video after. Well, I tried to, I tried to break my kids down during the year. I, I, I told them at the start of the year, take one swing in a game and it felt good to you, right? It feels good to you. And we kept that, we kept that swing for the whole year. We never looked at another swing except that one if they didn't feel right. But to learn in the cage, swing by swing, the biggest thing about all of us, when we hit in the cage, it was with a purpose. It was I'm going to feel that line drive to right center. I'm going to feel that line drive to left center. And then when I go in the game, when I, I'm just going to react and God willing, that same swing comes out. Um, but that's the biggest thing for me. It, it, instead of when you go into the cage, you're going for feel. Now they're going for numbers. Well, what does that do? What does BP do when you hit eight out of 10 balls out of the yard? Is that, does that really help you? No doesn't help you all it does is oh dude i just hit a ball that was 56 miles an hour 420 feet well here comes 96 with sink cut slider how are you going to do now and, and and that's the biggest thing for me is it's just making adjustments learning how to make adjustments practicing with a purpose um that's just not really done anymore man it's just really unfortunate and it's and you see it and did guys even ask you about it or is it just <laughs> more of you know the attitude of you know of well you don't know i know more than you so you just continue to put the ball in here and don't say anything did you run into guys that way kids that were that were that would do that stuff yes sir yes sir no respect yeah. for you or for the game itself really just a matter of well i just, wouldn't say it was necessarily a no respect i think um uh you know with the twins at the start my first five years of the twins nobody said a word uh because they knew the twins way um, obviously when the regime started, you know, changed over numbers started, kids started getting more into the analytical side of it, the number side of it. And the kids would ask me, you know, Hey, I just hit a ball 94 miles an hour on a line up the middle for a single. And they would come to me and they would be like, Hey man, how can I get that ball elevated? And I'm like, gee, many Christmas dude. I under, I completely understand what you're saying. But home runs are misses. And Rudy always told us that, man, home runs are misses. And if you practice with a purpose thinking line drive, that home run miss will come. And so, like, I'm like, guys, do you understand, like, a line drive up the middle is probably the most pure swing that you can make. It is pure. And if you happen to be one time just a little bit under it, it's not that you're trying to be under it. It just happened. And then, boom, I hit a homer. You know, I tell kids this all the time when I hit with them right now. Barry Bonds hit with Christian Yelich. God, I don't know what it was, five years ago when, when Yelich had his phenomenal, you know, year. And they have a video of Barry Bonds teaching Christian Yelich to hit the ball a foot in front of the plate because he wanted to stay on top. And then he moved it out 10 more feet, 15 more feet, 20 more feet. But Yelich thought, I'm going to hit a line drive at the shortstop. And the guy hit like 50 home runs. But we don't teach that, dude. We're teaching hit it in the air. Let's hit it 35 degrees instead of 18. I'm like, what are we doing, dude? You teach the opposite, but the home runs will come. And I just, that's why I got out of the game. I couldn't stand it anymore.
It's t- it's it is tough, right? Because it, it goes against everything that we were taught. Oh, everything, everything. I mean, Rudy, you know, God bless him. Uh, Rudy, to me, like like you've said, he he is the best I've ever been around. And now, can everyone uh, can everyone say that? Probably not. But for the guys who worked with Rudy, there's not going to be one thing negative said about Rudy. I know that for a fact. And so, like. You can't teach every single kid to hit the same way, but the basics of hitting the, you know, the lower half and the approach and the discipline of what you do with your hands, I think can be taught. Now, does that mean you're going to have, everybody's going to have the same swing? Nope. But the way you think and the way you use your lower half, that should be, in my opinion, everyone should be pretty damn close to the same. And now that's, it's not taught because everyone sees a guy 6'7", 260, hit 64 home runs, and they think a guy that's 5'9", 180 can do the same thing. Nope, not going to happen. But that's where we're at. We, we, they are teaching a robot to hit, not a human being, and feel. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing. You see all these gimmicks online, you, you know, that – the, oh, I mean, it seems like they've gone to Lowe's and Home Depot and pulled everything off the shelf and figured out that this can be this, this, and this, where if any one of us would have shown up with that to batting practice with Rudy, he would have probably beaten us to death with it. Oh, he, right? he, he would have broke every machine, every PVC pipe that has ever been put on a baseball field when I was with the Cubs. I mean, he, he would have he would probably would have burned it or, or broke, like you said, broke it in half. No question. Absolutely. Because in it, oh gosh, you're you're right, and it's you just hope that that we as you know you know you talk you don't want like old school new school. I I see it as old school is team oriented, new school is me oriented, and that's yep. how I look at it as as far as you know we talk about the 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 old school way of bunning guys over, you know, hitting behind runners that way of, of building around a team, right? Because you're getting for a common goal. Now it seems it's become an individualized thing. And if guys like us say anything, we're getting pushed to the back because that's not working. Nobody wants to hear it. Right. No, that's the, even like you said, even from a hall of famer guys, that, you know, we still see it online. Guys are still, uh, well, you know, Frank Thomas and Jim tell me, don't know what they're talking about because they're not doing this. That, you're missing the point here of everybody wants to take everything that somebody says as, as gold. You, it's not, you've got to take different pieces of different yes. guys. And yes, sir. you look at the yes. swings the, of back then guys standing up back hitting the baseball. Now all you see are guys heads dropping, right? Everything. And it's, and it's frustrating. It's painful to watch when you have a game go 17 innings, right? The Seattle Houston game. And it's one, nothing. Oh yeah. That, oh yeah. I don't even think it'd be even considered a pitcher's duel. I think it's just, I think Dave Stewart said it best. He goes, pitchers don't get hitters out. Hitters get themselves out. They've got to throw something over 17 inches and make a mistake. And it's hitter. And it's, I think it's even more prevalent now of, of how bad hitters are. Like you said, I think in the national league, only three guys hit over 300. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean but it, since 2000, you know, they, they, they had this stat when I was with the Cubs and, and, they didn't want to listen to what we said, but it, from 2016 to 2021, and I don't know what the numbers are this year, but every single year from 2016 to 2021, when analytics was introduced to the game, every single year, strikeouts up, averages down every single year. And, you know, I, I would just love to see an organization get an owner God bless it. It's probably never going to happen. But to me, get an owner who is a, a, a an ex baseball player, like a you know like Jeter did. But obviously, Jeter probably got caught up in the analytics too and said, you know, screw this. Um, that owns the team and takes baseball coaches and puts them in the minor leagues and in the big leagues, and you have what you would consider a. Uh, Again, uh, don't like the word, but uh, an old school baseball team. And I'm going to be willing to bet that team has a pretty damn good year. Um, but that's not going to happen because the the GMs 
uh, the owners in baseball now, majority of them are non-baseball people. The people who run the hitting departments now, non-baseball people. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Again, I'm not degrading anyone, but there has to be a middle ground and there is no middle ground. And, and that's the unfortunate thing for baseball is, is I truly think we're have kids out there that have the talent to play in in the big leagues, but they're not able to get to the big leagues because they cannot do what uh, they are being taught to hit the ball in the air. And they don't care about a guy that hits 290, 310 with 10 to 15 home runs. That's a damn good baseball player, but they don't care about that anymore. They want 240, 250, 25, 30, 150 punch outs, 80 RBIs. Good year, bud. Gr really good year. You're helping the team out a lot because I'm going to guess that probably, you know, you look at home runs now, how many of them are solo home runs? Well, you know, if you had a guy on first base that hits 300 before that guy that's hitting, you know, 25 homers, it, it, it'd be a two run homer. But that rarely happens anymore because why? Because the guy in front, punch out, punch out, homer, punch out, punch out, homer. But if you had five guys on the lineup, hit 280, 290, maybe a two, three run homer. But, you know, it is what it is. That's just the game today. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see where the where this goes in the next few years. You know, to, to you know, hopefully, hopefully it stops. But uh, hey, but yeah. you never know, man. So you know, we'll we'll have to definitely have to revisit this again, Chad, and, and if, you know, and, and see <laughs> yes. how much of what we learned is still being taught and and, and where it goes, though. You know, so yeah. it'll be it'll it'll definitely be interesting for sure. But yes, uh, but I appreciate you jumping on here today and, and talking no, man. talking this Absolutely. And, and you know I love you know people hearing you know our thoughts and just guys that have played in just different philosophies and it's you know interesting to see how we all how we all think with this. But like I said, we'll see where this goes. So man, man I appreciate yes, you sir. jumping on here and uh, Absolutely. we'll definitely have to do this again. So. Absolutely, All right. bud. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. Thank you very much, buddy. Absolutely. We'll have to get out and play some golf here, too, Chad. I'd love to. I'd All love right, to. man. All, All right, right, I'll man. be in touch, man. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. All right, Thank thanks, you. Jeff.